Well, Thanksgiving week. Thank you. It's, um, it's a time to be grateful and thankful for things that have taken place within your life. You, many of you had uh, lunch or dinner with some of your friends or your family. And one of the things you got to do is just got to say thanks. Thanks for being my friend. Thanks for being my family. And you just got to chill a little bit and, and just to eat, drink, Watch football and sleep. How about that? Um, but you know, whenever there's something negative, it's very easy to stay in the negative. Isn't that true? When something negative takes place, a circumstance happens, it's like, ah, oh, man, uh, every, the world's going to fall in on us. And, and sometimes when we go negative and we think negative, it seems like everything about my situation is a calamity. And sometimes we get to the point that we cannot, in our hearts, just say, thank you, Lord. We can't see the positive in the midst of the negative because we go negative. And the Bible tells us that, that one of the conditions of a Christian should be a, having a thankful heart. The Bible says in 1 Peter, and the end times, one of the things is going to be having an unthankful heart. That we can't look at somebody and say, thank you. We, sometimes we look at things and say, well, they ought to do that, or that's what they should have done, instead of saying, thank you. Thanks for what you've done within my life. Thanks for your service. Thanks for your mentorship. Thanks for your friendship. Thanks for what you do. And sometimes we can just say, thank you. We don't have to give them money. What money does is nothing compared to somebody that says, thank you. I appreciate what you do. What happens is it does something to the heart and it does something to their mind to say somebody noticed, somebody was appreciative about something that I didn't know they even knew about. And I wanted to say thank you. It changes not only the heart of the person that gave the compliment, but it changes the heart of the person that received that compliment. I have never given somebody a compliment, a sincere compliment that did not come with a smile on their face because people want to be recognized. But the other side of that is the negative side of that. And if all we do is see the negative of people and not the positive people, what happens is we live and they live in that negative side. Now, today's sermon is, has to do with 10 lepers. And 10 lepers were around and Jesus saw them and Jesus blessed and he healed all 10 of these lepers. And it's a phenomenal story, but I wanna take the story of one man, one leper that had a thankful heart that Jesus healed him. 10 men were healed of their leprosy. They were men dying and Jesus come alongside them and he heals them. But only one? How could only one of the 10 that had to go to a leper colony that was away from their family could not hug their child? Why could not they say, let's go to Jesus? Let's thank the man that healed him. But no, only one man fell at the feet of Jesus and worshiped him. Oh, 10 men were blessed, but only one man got to really experience the power, the forgiveness, and the relationship of Jesus. How many times are we blessed? How many times we don't even realize that God is blessing us? Sometimes we think it's us. Sometimes we think it's the circumstances. Sometimes we think that I'm a good enough employee that I should get that raise or I should do what I do. And we always think it, look how good I am. But when you take a step back, you look at God and you say, you know what? If he wasn't in charge of my life, I would have absolutely nothing. In every circumstance of life, God has orchestrated, loved, and mentored you at that point. You know, you look back in different areas of your life. And you can look back and you can say, after it's over with, you could say, thank you. Now, in the midst of the struggle, maybe not. Maybe in the midst of the struggle, you're thinking, why, 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 why do I have to go through this? But when you look back, maybe it's a week or two weeks or even a couple years, you can look back and you can see how God has orchestrated something within your life to make you better than what you could have ever been yourself. 
And you can then fall on your face before God and say, thank you. Now, me being the pastor here for so long, um, some of the older members of the church that have not old as age-wise, but been here for 10 to 15 years, uh, you hear this story and you're thinking, okay, that's the third time I've heard the story. But those that are new in the last three or four years, uh, you don't know the story. But it fits this illustration really well, and it's one of the most impactful things that uh, I've got to experience over the last eight years. Um, my dad had cancer, and he was in his last stage of cancer. And uh, he, 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 was, he was a big guy like me. And all of a sudden, after about four or five years, he shrunk down, uh, and he was uh, just a shell of who he was. And uh, we all knew that time was getting short. But one day, I got a phone call from the hospital and said, your mother has just been uh, admitted to the hospital with a stroke. I said, oh no, no, mom is in the hospital with a stroke and then dad was going on. And so I, I booked down to the hospital. Uh, they lived in Wamego, Kansas. And uh, we booked down to the hospital and they, they took mom with a stroke and dad hadn't driven in, in months. He was totally confused, and Wamega was a town of about three or 4,000 people, so he got in the car, and he got lost going up to the hospital. Somebody said, just scoot over, let me get in the car, and I'll take you up there, and they took him up there, and, and so mom was admitted. She was completely out of it. She was completely out of it, and dad was in the same hospital room with my mom, admitted in the hospital because of his weakness, and he was close to death. As I had the privilege of spending a day and a night just talking to my dad. And we had a great relationship growing up. I mean, he went to all the games, and he coached my baseball teams, and we had a great relationship growing up. And, but, you know, since I became pastor and moved away, it's kind of, you know, we talk on the phone, but we didn't really have this in-depth conversation. For a day and a half, I had the privilege of sitting at the foot of my dad's bed, praying with him, talking to him about his salvation, talking to him about what God is doing within his life. And tears coming down his eyes. And he says, I don't know what to do with your mother. I don't know what we can do or what we should do, whether I can't take care of her in this condition. So we sat down for a day and a half. He, he would go to sleep and he'd wake back up and he'd say, well, what, what were we talking about? And so we start that conversation again. And it was just a sweet time for a day and a half with my dad. And I thought, okay, that's good. So um, I drove back. It was a Saturday. I drove back and preached here. And then um, Sunday night, after we had church, I got a phone call from the hospital. I thought, oh, they're going to tell me that mom passed away. And they said, uh, Bruce, your dad passed away. And your mom is awake. I said, what? What? And mom is completely fine. She had no side effects from the stroke, and she just woke up. But dad passed away. So we had the memorial service, and I had the, I had the privilege of preaching my dad's memorial service and just talk about him and knowing that he's saved and knowing what is going on within his life. And at the time, I didn't really see why I would be thankful about that. And it wasn't about the funeral service. It wasn't about my mom having a stroke. It wasn't about my dad having cancer and dying. It boiled down to a day and a half. A day and a half. My dad was close to 75 years of age. And in my life with him, it boiled down to a day and a half. He and I, just talking. Him passing away. And I boiled that down because of this. The last words of somebody that you love means a lot. It could change everything. And everything that he talked about was his kids and his wife. That's who he cared about. He wanted to know what was going on with the boys. He wanted to know what we were going to do. So I look back at this Thanksgiving if I could boil my dad and I's relationship down to a day and a half, 
I can say thank you. Thank you for impacting my life and to mentor, mentoring to me and putting me on the path that I need to be on. Thank you. I know the negative circumstances. I know the problems that we all had, and I know the calamities that took place, and I know the dysfunction within the Thomas family is great. But you know what I can say? I can say thank you. I can say thank you because God orchestrated for me a moment, a day, that is ingrained in the back of my head that whenever I get to be old and 54 years old, I am going to remember that day because I am thankful for God for orchestrating that to me. Now, you have thankful hearts. You understand how, how important it is to be grateful and to be thankful. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 17. I'm going to give you the scripture, and then I want to give you some principles that go along with it, because we are talking about a, a grateful heart and how to be thankful, how to, how to look somebody and say, thank you. It doesn't take anything away from you to give away a compliment, to say thanks for what you've done. It doesn't do anything negative to you to lift somebody up. It is always a positive. It's always something that can be an encouragement to other individuals. Thank you. And you can always look at the positives to every circumstance. With every negative, we should look at two of the positives and try to raise what are the positives about what I'm going on. I don't have to go negative. I can look at the positive. I can understand what God is trying to do. I may not understand the circumstance. I may not understand all the problems, but I can see that God is going to orchestrate this, and I can see some of the positives within it. Let's look at the leprosy story. As Jesus continued on towards Jerusalem. And he, was, he was going to be crucified. He was on his way to be put to death. He reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered a village, there were 10 lepers stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. These lepers were had to keep a distance. They couldn't be around anyone. They were exiled to a leper colony. They couldn't touch their family. They couldn't hug their child. They couldn't do anything. They were exiled to a colony, and they saw Jesus was coming. They yelled at Jesus, Jesus, we know that you have performed miracles. We know what you have done. Please have mercy on us. They cried out. They knew that if they did not have the impact of Jesus within their life, their destiny was death. There was no way. They couldn't see their family. They were disfigured. It was a nerve issue within their body. They, they couldn't feel their legs. They, couldn't, they could walk on rocks and cut their legs and cut their hands, and their face become disfigured. It, it was a very grotesque, grotesque disease. Exiled to live with a bunch of people that were just like them. Grotesque, lonely, bored. Destiny is soon death. But these 10 men, they heard that Jesus was coming to town. And from a distance, Jesus, have mercy. We need you. I, I need you. The priest of the day had the, had the opportunity to look at every leper, everyone that was brought to them as lepers, and say, unclean. And they would be kicked out of the church. They could not worship God, kicked out of their home. But also, the priest was the only man that could say, clean. Your leprosy is gone, which hardly ever has happened. 14, he looked at them and said, go show yourself to the priest. He didn't say be healed. He didn't say, okay, I'm having mercy on you. Go, you're healed. But he did do this. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleaned of their leprosy. Was it about Jesus? He did the miracle. He said, go. And as they left to go to the priest, they had faith. They started to look at themselves. 
They started looking at their friends' faces and their hands and the disfigurement, the issues with their legs. And they said, we're, we're healed. We're healed. So they went and cleansed their le leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Ten men healed. Ten men, as soon as they get claimed clean, they're going to go to their house and they're going to hug their wife. They're going to hug their kids. They're going to eat uh, their meal. They're going to enjoy what they had. They were excited what Jesus had done. They went to the priest. They lived their life, but they didn't thank the man that gave them life. You know, our church and our culture is somewhat very similar to that. We thank God when it's convenient. We say, God, I need you now. We give it the 911 foxhole conversion. When I need God, God, give it to me. He says, go on your way. And maybe a day later, a week later, a month later, a year later, the very thing that you asked for, God has delivered. But then in our minds, we think with circumstance, we think it's something that I have done, but it was the very thing that you asked God for. And we don't even thank God for it. But this one man did. He looked at himself. He came back to Jesus, and he fell on his face before Jesus and said, thank you. Thank you. But listen to what Jesus said. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God? Jesus is calling himself. He's on the way to the cross. And here right now, he's saying, I am God. Did I heal this man? Were there not nine? Where are they? They returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. And Jesus said to them, stand up. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. I want to give you some points. This story has phenomenal illustrations to where we are in our own life. The first one, you have a deadly problem that only Jesus can fix. These lepers, they were outcast. They were going to die. They were socially unacceptable. They were about to die. They met Jesus. And every one of us, we have a sin problem that until we come into the encounter of Jesus and meet Jesus with our sin problem, we are destined to die and separate from God. But when we say, Jesus, have mercy on me, Jesus is going to come, wrap his arms around us and forgive us and give to us faith, hope, and a security in a relationship with him. Many of us want that. Many of us have heard about it. Many of us have gone to church. Many of us have experienced the Christianese. But have we came back and worshiped the one that saved us? See, I truly believe easy Christianity is going to a summer camp and raising your hand to say that you know Jesus because a good, compassionate pastor got up and he spoke and moved your heart. I don't want to go to hell. So, yeah, I, I want to go to heaven. So they get 20, 30, 40, 50 kids raising their hand, but as soon as they walk out of that door, nothing changes. I believe sometimes the words out of our mouth are nothing to God's ears, but I believe it's the condition of the heart, the way that we ex ex express ourselves, and then the words out of our mouth mean something when it's something real within deep within our heart. They were all healed. But the one that came back fell on his face before God and said, thank you. He realized it was God that changed his life. And in our life, we have to get to the point that God is the only one that's going to change our life. And in the need of our sin, God is the only one that can forgive our sin. We can do good. We can do all the 12-step programs we want. We can identify I've got a problem, but the identification is I need Jesus to change my life. 
The second thing, you must admit your need and cry out to Jesus. You must admit your need and cry out to Jesus. You know, there's all kinds of issues in every relationship. And I have a good, not a good friend, but a guy that I, I really like. His name's Andy Stanley. And he says this in his counseling. Before you can fix it, you got to claim it. Before you can say, I've got a problem, you got to claim the problem. I, sometimes, I am the problem. We can't fix a problem that we do not claim. We can't understand the problem until it comes to light. And in this area, you must admit your need and cry out to Jesus. Lord, I am a sinner. Just like the 10 men, Lord, have mercy on us. I am a sinner. The third thing, God's power is not released until you step out in faith. God's power is not released until you step out in faith. Go show yourself to the priests. He could have at this time said, you're healed. Oh, okay, yeah, now I'll worship you. Now, because you asked me to, and you're right here in front, of course, I've, I've, got, I've got to praise you now because you did this and everybody's watching, so thank you, Jesus. But he said this, go, show yourself. He knew that he healed them. One man understood who healed him. Nine men were excited about what happened to them, but they did not give the glory to the one that did the work. In our life, what we must do is we must go. We must go through life. We must allow God to work within our life. And the, left, and the life that we live and the blessings that we get, what we must do is we must understand and not be ashamed to say, this one's Jesus. This one's God. God fixed this. I need to give God the glory on this. Because if I do not give God the glory on this, God's going to look at me and say, I can't give you because what you are supposed to be is a reflection of me. And if I keep giving to you blessings and giving to you uh, these awesome opportunities, but you're keeping them for yourself, you're not bowing down and worshiping me. You're worshiping the blessing. And I don't want you to worship the blessing. I want you to worship the blesser. I want you to fall on your face before God and say, thank you. Thank you for everything that you have given to me. Sometimes we have to move and show out in our walk. Show others. Show what God can do. Um, the fourth, it is good to spend time at the feet of Jesus. It's good to spend time at the feet of Jesus. This is called humility. Other word for this is brokenness. And I truly believe Broken things have more power than just new things. You know, we use this illustration that, you know, we, the Western civilization, we throw broken things away. We have a, a $49 bike from Walmart, it breaks, and you're like me, I don't know how to fix it, so we throw it away. Something happens with our 19-inch TV, and we don't know how to fix it, so either we give it to the church or we um, throw it away. <laughs> but here's what God does. He takes broken people, fixes them, puts them on display, and say, you are better than anything. You are better because you will be made with me, the brokenness that you have, the scars that you have, even the cracks that I had to fill in, it's very, it's very noticeable that you have been broken. That vase that you dropped that I picked up and I had to put back together, oh, it's, it's, it's usable, but it has some scars on it. And God says, that vase is the vase that I want to show off. Anybody can go buy a vase. But the broken vase that I got on my hands and knees and I picked up every piece 
and I put every piece back together with my tender, loving hands, that vase is the vase that I want to use. And I believe the vases of our life, the brokenness in our life, the times that we feel like I don't know what to do, but God works within our life, is the times that we spend our time at the face, on our face before God with humility. Because to be honest, humility is not an easy topic. I could talk about arrogance, I have no problem with that one. But humility, being broken, falling on my face and saying, thank you Lord, I couldn't have done this without you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for the circumstances. Thank you for the, even the problems within my life. I don't know how I can do that. But that's what God has asked us to do. And then feeling thankful is different than giving thanks. Feeling thankful is different than giving thanks. You know, Thanksgiving holiday, we kind of all felt thankful. Thankful for the food, thankful for the family. We all just feeling good. I, I didn't really feel that good at 3.30 to 6.30. That wasn't, that wasn't the, the Cowboys game. If that would shrink that three hours away, then we'd be all right. But, you know, we had a good time. But feeling thankful, but giving thanks is a whole different thing. I came up here just on, just on this platform uh, this week. Uh, we came in, Connie and Brenda and some of the guys were just making the platform, making it ready for Christmas, and we're going to try to get it set that if you want to do your Christmas cards up here, you can come in and take a picture of your Christmas cards and make it kind of cute and nice, and you know, I, you know, I th- I th- yeah, that's nice, but I haven't said, Connie, where's Connie? Thank you. You spent two days up here. This is yours. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Amen. That's good. When somebody does something, thank you. Um, the Wellington Community Group. They're remodeling the bathroom, the 50-year-old bathroom in the old, in the old entryway. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's, that's hard work. That's hard work. We had community groups go out to the Air Force Base and serve uh, suppers this week. Thank, thank you. That's awesome. We had a community group paint the bus barn that was been tagged five years ago. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. There's all kinds of things that when we serve, we are saying I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to do things. Feeling thankful is different than giving thanks. Thanks. When we can give thanks, it's a condition of the heart. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, though Jesus therefore let us continually offer to give God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Offer a sacrifice of praise. Being able to sing be able to say thank you, be able to raise up your hands and worship God, just doing what God has asked us to do. It is being thankful, not only feeling it, but giving him thanks, giving him praise. And when we can be thankful and we can give him praise, God does great things. Now, this is what the one man did when he came back. A relationship with Jesus makes you a foreigner in this world. We are not our own. We've been bought by a price. Listen to these two verses. Philippians chapter three, verse 20. But our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior. From there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is not here. When we have given our life to Christ, our citizenship is in heaven. We're a stranger in this world. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, I urge you as strangers and aliens of this world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. And we have to realize, when we gave our life to Christ, just like the man, he was a Samaritan, he was a foreigner, just like that with our Christian faith, we are foreigners sometimes. When we have given our life to Christ, we look at this world And we wonder, why don't they accept us? Why do they hate Jesus? Why why is Christians being targeted? I don't understand. Why is it if I go to church, I get mocked? Why is it that if I tell somebody God bless them, 
they look at me. Why is it that when I put my kids in a college that is secular sometimes that they go against the very foundations of Christianity? Why is it that we have to teach them the principles of God's word while they're young? Is because they hated Jesus. And if they hated Jesus, they will hate you. It's nothing about you. It's about who you represent. And if Jesus is represented in your life, in your heart, in your actions, in your conduct, in your conversation, if you represent Christ, take honor because they crucified Jesus. And if you are like Christ, a little Christian, if you are like Christ, they too will ridicule you. Is it easy? No. That's why we spend our knees before God. That's why we come to church because sometimes we need help. We need encouragement, we need prayer, we need humility. We can't say it's not worth it. Sometimes we just need to spend a little bit of time with Christ. A relationship with Jesus makes you a foreigner to this world. But the last one is, is the best. Let Jesus finish what he started in you. Let Jesus finish what he started in you. The last part of that verse um, Verse 19, and Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Worshiped him, fell down before him. Jesus picks him up. He says, stand up. You are whole. Go. Go. Go see your family. Go testify what has taken place today. Your faith has made you whole. Could you imagine what that Samaritan that was on the deathbed with leprosy, what he did? You think what? You think he just said, hey, I'm back. The kids are looking at him and say, whoa, dude, come on. 10 foot rule here, I don't, I don't want you to breathe. I, don't, I really don't want you to hug me. The wife didn't say, hey, none of that. He sat down with them, I guarantee you, and he said, guys, let me tell you what took place. I was at the colony, ready to die, and a certain man came in. And that certain man was Jesus. And Jesus, with his words, healed me. I am whole. And after he healed me, I, I couldn't help myself, so I fell at his feet. And I just said, thank you. I understand Jesus, the very Son of God, reached down and touched me. And he picked me up. And I'm not the same person any longer. And in our sin, in our life, it is the same thing. We may have calamities, we may have issues, but when we have an encounter with Christ and we talk to people, I don't know what took place. I don't know why it took place. But all I know is I met Jesus. And after I met Jesus, he picked me up. He saved my soul. He changed my life. I can't talk about anything else because nothing else had fixed me. Just Jesus. Touching Jesus changes everything about us. It changes our heart. It gives us freedom. It gives us forgiveness from our present. And some of you need to hear this and from your past. Forgiveness. When you encounter Christ, everything changes. Your faith has made you whole, complete, righteous, Go, do your work. And I guarantee you, the people that you have impact with, the people that love you, the people that care about you, the people that understood where you were and what you have done, and they understand, whoa, dude, you going to church? <laughs> really? Absolutely. I was a dirty, rotten sinner. I was a scumbag. I treated people terrible. But I fell on my face before Jesus, and he forgave me. You know what? I don't have any place else 
The only place I can go is to Jesus. And when I go to Jesus, it changed my heart and it changed my life. So yeah, my past is gone. My future is secure because I met Jesus and he broke me. Just like a vase, he broke me. And all the pieces fell all over the place. But you know what he did with those pieces? He didn't scoop them up and throw them in the trash. Little by little, scar by scar, issue by issue, he picked it up. And it may take some time. He picks it up. He works on it, polishes it up, and he puts the vase of life back together. And when you look at it close, you say, wow, that is a nasty looking vase. But here's what Jesus does. He takes that vase with all the scars, with all the broken pieces, and you would think, that is worthless. He goes and he gives your vase to people that need exactly the vase that you are. And he allows your life to impact people's lives. But first, before he can allow you to impact somebody else's life, you have to say, I need to be broken. I need Jesus to fix me, to change me, to love me, and to help me. You don't have to look for things to do. Jesus gives you things to do. You don't have to look for people that are hurting because everybody is hurting. You don't have to do something. All you have to do is you have to proclaim what Jesus did for you. I was broken. I had alcohol issues. I had pornography issues. I had adultery issue. God forgave me. You talk about what God did, people will listen. And let me tell you, when people listen, and you're quiet, and you're by yourself, a lot of crowds around, people say, hey, um, you know those things that you were talking about? Can we talk a little bit more about that? Um, I really don't want everybody to know, but I have a couple of those same problems. And I've been fighting that for years. And I have no one to talk about. Could we kind of talk about that a little bit? Because we are broken, because we are humbled, and because we're willing to be used of God, people will find you when you glorify God. God, he changes our lives. He glorifies us. You know what he's asked us to do? Thank him. Thank you, Lord. Get up and go do your work. Make me known, not only here, but around the world. That is what thankfulness is all about. Who is Jesus to you? He's my savior. He's my friend. He's my forgiver. I just want to worship him and thank him for what he has done for me. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we do come before you. We thank you. We thank you for the ability to fall on our face before you and say thank you for what you've done for me. We all have needed your forgiveness. And many of us, every day. But Lord, what you have done for us is you have transformed our heart and our lives. You made us into a vessel that you can be used and you can put us where you want us to go. You can bring people into our lives that can use my broken pieces and I can minister to them in a way that you have developed me and you've mentored me. So Lord, allow us to do that. Allow us to be used. Change us, forgive us, love us. We thank you for what you've done in our life. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Okay, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Bruce. I um, love the subject of brokenness. And I love to hear this man preach on brokenness. If you've never experienced it, stick around.